Um, hi, um, my name is Peter Hopkins and I'm the University Dean of Social Justice with Heather Smith, who's joined here today. Hi, Heather. Um, Heather and I were putting together um, with uh, Liz Todd in the Institute for Social Science an event around um, anti-racism. We really wanted to talk about anti-racism, what it is, what it means and how we practice it um, within the university. Unfortunately, due to COVID-19, we, we've had to cancel the event. And so now what we're doing is we're planning to have an online conversation today um, and to share resources and ideas from across the university from different people that are working um, on this um, topic. And then in future we'll have some follow-up conversations on Zoom where we can try and explore these issues in a bit more depth. Um, so, so today is a conversation with Heather. Um, Heather's a senior lecturer in the School of Education and is a very ex um, ex experienced teacher who's taught in primary schools and at secondary level as well as at, um, at university level and at postgraduate. Um, and she's worked at Newcastle since 2004 um, and one of Heather's main areas of expertise is around anti-racism. Um, so thanks for uh, taking the time to, to sh uh, share your experience with us today, Heather. So first of all, I was wondering what does anti-racism mean to you as a teacher of education? Oh, thanks, Peter. Well, um, I think it's best to start with the history, really, of anti-racism in education. Um, to give a bit of background as to where we are now and what we need to do. Um, I think you could start with the 50s and 60s, the sort of policy, social policies, and um, which were captured within education policies of assimilationism, where you just have to disappear as quickly as you possibly could. And that was swiftly followed 60s, 70s into um, official policies, which um, you could call integrationism. Um, which was very similar really to uh, assimilation and that was about adapting to the majority cultural majority society without any real changes to that society or to the structures within that system um, but in 1971 there was a really important and probably the first of its kind education report by um, British uh, black educationist called um, Bernard Cord and um, he wrote a, what they call a pamphlet which was called How the West Indian Child is Made Educationally Subnormal and that was published in 1971 and that was really the first time although he didn't use the term institutional racism but it really was an exposition of the way that these assimilationist and integrationist policies were in fact structurally uh, or institutionally racist um, and then you moved into the 1970s to the 80s and the first um, I suppose government sanctioned policies are on multiculturalism and these were policies that recognized um, plurality, cultural plurality, but again, did nothing to um, attend to, uh, particularly in, in, to racism. And in fact, the policies were, had a tendency towards essentialism, token, you know, they were very tokenistic, they were re very reductive. And in fact, one of the, um, a really important um, educational scholar, black educational scholar from Britain called ba Barry Troynier. He captured that by calling them, uh, along with Bruce Carrington actually, who used to work here, he captured that by calling it the three, a period of the three S's, saris, samosas and steel bands. So really it did nothing um, to address racism, but elements of that multiculturalism has remained with us in many of the education practices you'll see in schools. And then you move on um, to Thatcherism. Obviously there was no such thing as society in that, you know, as, as she coined it. Um, and uh, in that period, you started to get the rise of official discourses around colour blindness and that would 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 have um, also been um, uh, visible in some of the school policies um, and then you get swiftly after Thatcherism with the um, New Labour you get what uh, Professor David Gilborn calls in his book which gives a much more detailed account of the history in this book um, he he calls naive and then cynical multiculturalism. So naive multiculturalism was very reminiscent of the early forms of multiculturalism. And then cynical multiculturalism was a slide into 
um, what he called in 2008, and I think we're there now, um, a slide into, um, I think they called it muscular integrationism. So after the terrorist attacks in London, um, there were calls by Tony Blair for muscular integration. Um, mm. And that's what he called part of cynical multiculturalism. But David Gilborn calls the current period, or at least from 2008, and I think it's still relevant today, aggressive majoritarianism. And this is a period um, in which a disciplinary securitization agenda within education came to the fore. And I don't think people realize how much of an impact all of that has had on not only policies, but also practices and places where school, that schools have become. Um, it, is, it is pretty terrifying, actually, <laughs> what's been happening out there in terms of the policy and practices. But I'm just going to give you a little bit of a flavor of it. So um, in 2012, and one of my, I, I've written a paper on this. In 2012, the, 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 was the last time a set of standards for student teachers was published. And they go right back all the way in time. But 2012 was the last one and we've still got it. It's just been tweaked slightly, but it's still the same sort of uh, document, same set of standards. And in that set of standards was the very first time, as far as I'm aware of, and, and I, I've checked this with other people, there was a reference to counter-terrorism in a public education policy. Because student teachers are told, in order to become a teacher, you must not undermine fundamental British values. And in the glossary of the original publication, there was a glossary at the beginning in the introduction and it had an um, explanation of words like school, parent, pupil, right at the top of the list, fundamental British values. And it says, and this is what it says, it reads, fundamental British values is taken from the definition of extremism as articulated in the new prevent strategy, which was launched in June 2011. It includes democracy, the rule of law, individual liberty, mutual respect and tolerance of different faiths and beliefs. So that was prioritised in a document of standards for student teachers. People like myself were absolutely horrified about this, but that wasn't the end of the story. I wish it was. But this aggressive majoritarian securitization agenda has continued. And in fact, it, it, it gathered pace. Because in 2014, there was what's now commonly called the Trojan Horse Affair. I don't know if you've heard of it. And that was where um, uh, what, what they now believe to be a false letter, a uh, false claims in a letter sent to Birmingham Council, that there was an Islamist plot to take over schools in Birmingham. Many of the schools were inspected, the leadership was sacked. Um, you know, there was, there was uh, several reports afterwards, official reports about what, the, what was happening in these schools. But besides all of that, as a consequence of it, Michael Gove, who was the then education secretary, he said that there would be a pledge. His pledge was to put British values at the heart of what schools have to offer. And in 2014, later in that same year, Ofsted changed its criteria such that a school, no school in England could, or Wales, I think it could be just England, could be um, graded outstanding if they did not put the promotion of fundamental British values at the heart of the school's work. And I don't think people know that. Mm. I don't think people know that schools mm. can, and it remains the case today, you cannot be as outstanding unless you can prove fundamental, not British values, not values, not school values, but fundamental British values is at the heart of what the school does. And that has led to very soon afterwards school websites, almost every school website now has, you know, we, we promote fundamental British values in this way. Uh, and, and you sometimes get displays in the schools for when Ofsted inspectors come around. But that's not even the end of it. <laughs> in 2015, the government then wrote their new Counterterrorism Security Act, in which teachers were given the legal responsibility to prevent people from being drawn into terrorism. 
and they undertook rap training. Somebody made an awful lot of money with rap training mm -hmm. um, to develop expertise in recognizing individuals who are vulnerable to being radicalized. Now, again, in one of my papers, I talk about um, the effect that that's had in schools mm. and how many children per day are being um, informed on because of this um, because of this legal situation. And then it goes on, you know, David Cameron made some remarks about Muslim women um, not being, not learning English, not being educated enough and, and, and making their children wear veils, young girls wearing um, veils, as he referred to, he referred to it as veils. And um, soon after that, um, I think it, uh, Sir Michael Wilshaw was the chief of Ofsted at the time in 2015. And Oh my God, this is, and it's still the case today. This is still the case, in fact, if not worse. He said that school inspectors will be allowed to rate schools as inadequate if they allow face fails mm -hmm. for, for Muslim children, for Muslim girls. Mm -hmm. So that's the statutory situation that we're in at the moment, um, accompanied by legal and regulatory powers making anti-racist work much, much more difficult and complex. Well, that's quite, um, <clears throat> that's quite a concerning history, isn't it? When you, you, you know, the way that you've just summarised the different themes, it had a sense that it was going to get better, but what you've just said, it's still quite concerning, some of the, the policies and the patterns that we're seeing. Mm. Uh, um, I mean, I think you use, um, you use critical race theory um, in your work, was wondered if you could say a bit about um, critical race theory and how that works. Okay, I mean, I can only talk about it from um, uh, the perspective of being an educator of teachers and mm. um, a teacher on the BA education degree. Um, but yeah, critical race theory was born from critical legal studies in America in the early 1970s. And this was black legal scholars who rose up to find a way of um, exposing and challenging and changing uh, racial, huge racial inequities in uh, the justice system in America. Um, what they call the school to, school to prison pipeline that exists in America, which of course is exactly what we're witnessing today. This is, this is what the Black Lives Movement, Black Lives Matter movement is, mm -hmm. is about. Um, and critical race theorists, it, the, the critical legal studies developed into a more rounded theory called critical race theory. And this is um, really at the heart is concerned with um, exposing, disrupting, challenging and changing racism, societal racism that helps to maintain the status quo. It's modus operandi of racism is to maintain the status quo, to maintain power in the hands who already have power. Um, and there, there are several, um, there are several tenets, if you like, of critical race theory, which are at the heart of it. Um, the first is that racism is endemic in the US, but also British society. It's not abnormal, it's normal, it's rife. And in education, it exists in policies and practices and systems and structures. They also um, insist on a critique of liberalism, such that uh, um, assumptions of neutrality, I'm sorry, I'm laughing because it's, it's so obvious to me, but assumptions of neutrality, meritocracy and um, colorblindness actually mm. um, are challenged. Um, because the end game of all of that is to blame those who are experiencing racism, mm -hmm. to blame individuals, to blame communities, to blame parents, and even to blame schools, rather than to really investigate anything structural. Mm -hmm. Another important aspect of critical race theory, as I see it, is the challenge to ahistoricism and decontextualization, and that's really important. Again, you'll see that today, you'll see the fact that um, it's certainly in America, but it's also COVID-19 is exposing this in Britain as well, how racism has affects all aspects of inequities in society, mm -hmm. housing, income, um, health, education, of course, education, and um, 
imprisonment, so anything to do with the justice system. Then it gets a little bit more complicated, I think you would say, or certainly in my mind. Um, critical race theory is also um, could be called interdisciplinary. Um, I think the thing to understand here is that it's openly political. Critical race theory is openly political. It is both utopian in imagining through concepts what is possible, but also pragmatic in, its, in the extent that it seeks action. It doesn't, just, it doesn't just live through its theories, through its concepts. It demands action. Um, so I think you could think of critical race theory, the action it requires is transformational rather than reformist in nature. Mm. Um, it also, and this is really important, central tenet as well, it insists on including the experiential knowledge of members of the community who have experienced racism. So for example, in, in the UK, we would talk about black Asian minority ethnic people or people from those communities who um, have experienced racism, have, ex have a lived experience of racism. And that's important to include in any concept of CRT. And finally, CRT, um, I, th I think sometimes it is accused of not being intersectional in its nature, but it is mm. because it strives for the elimination of racial oppression as one of many oppressions. But because many of us would argue that because of the um, political and empirical primacy of race, as is, mm. as is again being revealed now, mm. so the empirical primacy of race, many more BAME people are dying from COVID-19 because of poor income, poor housing, poor health, mm. poor education, whatever. All of that um, it has an empirical primacy. Mm. And um, it also has a political primacy because of what I've just described mm. to you is the current education system. We have to, we have to challenge it. We have to change it. So there is a, a political primacy to race as well. Um, and then if you don't mind, I'll just go on to some of the concepts, the analytic mm. concepts, which are crucial to uh, revealing racism in education. These are the, some of the concepts that I work um, on uh, uh, teach my students about. Um, sorry, my emails keep coming in. Now you can hear how many emails I'm getting. Um, I think, I mean, essential to it is the fact that race is not biologically real. It's a social mm. construction, although obviously racism is real. Um, but the fact that it's a social construction means that who, who is classified as white or Asian or black or in America, a person of color, changes over context and time. Mm. And that means you can't literally attach it to a physical body. Mm. And that's quite a complicated uh, message to get across mm. to students, but it's central. Mm. Um, and then you've got the concept of microaggressions. And I'm, I'm gonna read out the quote for that, what it means, um, because I think it's, it, again, it's important to get this right. So micro, microaggressions are brief and commonplace daily verbal, behavioral and environmental indignities, whether intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostile derogatory or negative racial slights and insults to the target person or group. And what's important about microaggressions is not just the fact that they happen, but they happen cumulatively. And over time, that has a very, very heavy burden on people. It, 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 you know, that it's the cumulative nature of microaggressions that are important. But in teaching about critical race theory, I think it's really essential not to focus just on individuals' attitudes or biases. So if you just focus on microaggressions, you can slip into the assumption that racism is just about changing attitudes and biases. Mm. Um, you know, it, we, we have to think about um, challenging the um, exploitative power structures that would remain in place, even if you were able to change everybody's individual behavior. Then you've got these really, for me, foundational concepts of interest convergence and interest divergence. And these were developed by Derek Bell, who is a black legal scholar, um, who was the first, I believe he was the first 
black professor to be tenured at Harvard School of Law. And he was one of the founders of critical race theory. And um, he defined um, interest convergence uh, in this way. And remember, this is American language. So mm -hmm. the interests of blacks in achieving racial equality have been accommodated only when they have converged with the interests of powerful white elites. And, you know, you and I were talking recently about this, and I see this now in some peoples and institutions, higher education institutions, responses to the Black Lives Matter movement. So, you know, it, 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 universities, for example, um, can claim that space of a, being a good university on the side of black on the side of the Black Lives Matter movement, but at the same time, in putting out any statements about that, um, that claim to that goodness can also be beneficial to them. Mm. So it's when those interests converge, and in terms of divergence, which is the opposite, I mean, he defines as a situation where white people imagine that some benefit will accrue from the further marginalization and oppression of racially minoritized groups. I can just think of yesterday, something that Boris Johnson said, he started to talk about, um, he started to talk about the Black Lives Matter movement as, um, you know, the problem with it is, sorry, I'm doing it. Um, <laughs> the problem with it is it's, um, it, it's about victimization and we need to be more positive. Mm -hmm. And that switch mm -hmm. in discourse mm -hmm. is, I think, an example of interest divergence. Uh, yeah, interest divergence, where mm -hmm. the, interests, it, it, the interests of the government are to make us all think it's about victimization, mm -hmm. not about the real things that are happening. And that way he doesn't have to attend to the yeah. real things that are happening. And then finally, sorry, I've talked a lot, but finally, um, you've got um, critical white studies or, or critical understandings of whiteness. Or so some people would talk about um, white supremacy. And I have a quote here because it, many people define it in many different ways that are similar. But I think this particular quote by Francis Lee Ansley is in 1997, this sum, summarizes it perfectly. A political economic and cultural system in which whites overwhelmingly control power and material resources, conscious and unconscious ideas of white superiority and entitlement are widespread and relations of white dominance and non-white subordination are daily reenacted across a broad array of institutions and social settings. So from that, the main concepts that I help my students with in terms of understanding whiteness. And remember, whiteness doesn't just mean attached to a white body or color blindness, the downplaying of racism as prevalent today, and reverse discrimination. There was a, a classic example of that on Question Time with that actor whose name I can't remember very recently. And that goes with the language of encroachment. This is just going too far. You know, I didn't own slaves, so why, why am I being involved in this? Centeredness, that's both the transparency and opaqueness of whiteness. It's, it's everything we see through, but it's, we don't see it at the same time. Um, silence, absences and silences are so important to the concept of whiteness. Um, and it's very difficult to argue something is absent. It's much easier to critique something that's there. Yeah. Um, but the way that policy and practices make, make all of us silent to racism is a really yeah. important part. Um, and, and also I work with student teachers specifically on, um, um, uh, on um, and, and make, how we make sense of racism sometimes, sometimes through analogies. So um, you might say, um, well, I've experienced, I've experienced um, bullying because, and it stops us listening to um, the lived experience of those who have experienced racism. Mm -hmm. So that's also problematic. But I just wanted to finish responding to that, Peter, with, um, I'm afraid, even more bad news. <laughs> In the sense that, and I want to get this right, but the work that we do in critical race theory and, and critical understandings of whiteness, especially with student teachers, mm. and there's so few of us involved in this work mm. because it doesn't form part of the standards. In fact, the word racism doesn't, ex doesn't appear in the teacher standards at all. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. Um, It's really important at this time because terrifyingly, eugenics is finding it's wriggling its way back into the conversation. Do you remember in January 2020, Dominic Cummings called for weirdos and misfits to join 10 Downing Street? Well, they employed a guy called Andrew Sabisky as a super forecaster. And Sabisky is openly an open eugenicist. And he has argued that policymakers should recognize very real differences in intelligence. Sorry, very real racial differences in intelligence. I mean, he's open eugenicist. But this is not the first time that Cummins has been involved with the eugenics movement because in 2013, when Michael Gove was education minister, minister, secretary for education, anyway, Michael Gove was in place. Mm. Um, so, uh, Dominic Cummings wrote a 237 page essay, which was leaked. And in that essay, he referred to work by the behavioral geneticist, Robert Plowman. And in it, in this essay, he says, Robert Plowman has shown that most of the variation in performance of children in English schools is accounted for by within school factors, not between school factors, of which the largest factor is genes. And then, you know, that Robert Plowman was co-author of a book, G is for Genes, The Impact of Genetics on Education and Achievement. And in the 11 recommendations for school policy that he that the, the authors give is the suggestion for the opening of huge genetically sensitive schools. Now, if that doesn't terrify you, I don't know what would. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so now is the time to teach our student teachers, in fact, all of our students, mm -hmm. about critical race theory and critical, percept critical um, understandings of whiteness. Okay, so there's, so there's quite a lot of concept and ideas there that are within critical race theory, but there's also some very concerning things that you've just shared. Um, there. Yeah. I, was just, I was wondering if there are other particular scholars within your work that, that really inspired you as an anti-racist researcher and educator, like there's certain people you always go to, or, you know, is it one yeah. person, is it, a, is it a body of people that are working in this area that you, you would yeah. also take inspiration? Yes to all of that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Professor David Gilborn, yeah. uh, you know, he that's his life's work, that's what he mm. writes about. Um, my um, friend and co-author, Professor Vinnie Lander, Mm -hmm. I learned, we, we, learned, we learned so much together. In terms of teacher education, there's a black scholar called Gloria Ladston Billings. She's also very important in terms of initial teacher education. But when I started to learn about this, um, I bought these books and these have been transformational for my understandings. Mm -hmm. And that is Critical Race Theory, The Cutting Edge. Mm -hmm. And this is by Delgado and Stefancic. And they also, well, not the whole book, but they've edited the book. And it's many of the foundational writings of critical race theory in that book. So it's really important. And you can see they're well filmed. And then Critical White Studies Looking Behind the Mirror, again, edited by Delgado and Stefancic. They're really important to me. And I don't want to be seen as um, sycophantic, but actually all my students, they yeah. always come to bring me, um, not always, but many of them bring me work and um, movies and artifacts um, that, that are new to me. So I learned about, wait a minute, I've got it here somewhere. This was a book that one of my students gave me and that meant that I learned about Akela. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's quite, it's a race and class in the ruins of empire, natives, um, you know, and he does a lot of work that particularly is relevant for young students. He's able to communicate that very well to young students. So I think the act of teaching this supports mm. your knowledge of it. Yeah, I mean, you, so you've been teaching in this area for maybe 15 or 16 years now, and I was wondering how you um, encourage your students to engage with um, and to practice anti-racism. So, um, you know, the event that we were going to have, mm -hmm. um, I put a PowerPoint together and a little bit of that might be relevant to answering that question. Yeah, so I'll, I'll try and share it. <laughs> um, where 
is it? This is not easy to do, is it? Hopefully it'll work. Mm. There we are. So I don't know, can you see that? Yeah, that's come up. I'll just start a bit further up. Um, so just to, to, I mean, it's very different. I haven't got time to tell you everything that I do in terms of the teaching and how I teach it. But, um, so I'm just going to move your picture, Peter, because you're right in the middle of the text. <laughs> um, but uh, if I think about premises, the first premise would be that um, student teachers conception of equality can be transformed. Mm. Um, and and I, I need as their educator to find ways of doing that to help them do that, uh, particularly if they're student teachers, because the vast majority of student teachers I have are white and maybe have never questioned or never thought about their own their own positionings within society. The second premise, which is the most problematic, I think, is that this process is emotionally taxing for people, uh, for students. Um, and that the act of being emotion, reacting emotionally to this work is itself something that the student teaches, the students themselves have to attend to and that I have to help them at attend to. So for example, um, I need to know that emotional, emotionality itself is a part of the practice of whiteness. Um, it deeply protects its normalization. And so uh, penetrating students' emotional reactions is an important aspect of teaching them about critical whiteness and, and critical race theory. Um, and I think it's very important um, that we understand and that I teach the students why that happens. Because when you have an emotional reaction to something, you feel it's very singular and individualized. You feel it's just you that's feeling it and that it's, it's, it's a part of you. And what you don't realize is that our emotional reactions, particularly around uh, race and racism, are part of the cultural practices which might include silencing, it might include color blindness, it might include perceptions of white as a savior. Um, so we've been inculcated into those practices which teach us how to read and behave in the world. And as Sarah Ahmed puts it, this is really important, she says, in reading the other as being bad, I might then be filled up with a bad feeling which then becomes a sign of the truth of that reading in the first place. So that's a cyclic process that unless you're, unless you're educated about is very difficult to, to, to break free of. And that means that the students' emotional reactions are something that I have to teach them about as well as help them or get, get around, if you like, overcome. I just wanted to tell you about some of the ways that this happens. Oh, the practice of, of attending to emotions in the teaching of this, uh, uh, teaching of racism is part of what's um, called, Megan Bowler calls the pedagogy of discomfort, um, which, you know, is a contentious issue, but I think it's useful for me as, as, as a teacher to understand that particular pedagogical approach and what I have to do. Um, I'll just give you an example here. I can't play this, but um, through, through this PowerPoint through Zoom, but um, I play many different clips from, um, uh, you know, uh, films that have been made. Um, and this one is called A Child of Our Time uh, by Professor Robert Winston. And this is with four year olds. And they repeat the White Doll, Black Doll project, which um, started in 1940s America. And they show the children four faces. So if it's a boy doing it, they would show them four boys' faces. And if it was a girl, they'd show them four, four girls' faces. And you can see all of the children are sort of shoulder headshots. And they ask the questions like, oh, who do you think's nice? Who would you like to play with? Who's good at maths? You know, who, who's, who, who would you like to sit next to when, you know, writing a story together, that sort of thing. Um, and what's terrifying is that the majority of the four-year-olds point to the white child for everything good and more or less all of the other children for everything, for anything that isn't good. 
So this particular boy, he's asked, uh, who do you think might be good at their writing? And he points to the white boy in the left-hand corner there. And they, she says, who isn't good at their writing? All the other children. And then why is he good at his writing? Because they've got a white face. That's a four-year-old. So that's a very powerful message for the students. But this is what happens. You get some of them shocked and they start to acknowledge their ignorance. But that can very, t very quickly turn into a, a woe is me, um, a li I think Bola calls it liberal nav navel gazing or hitting and Warren call it a discourse of self-absorption. Oh, it's terrible. I've never thought about this. Oh, I feel sick. Oh, my goodness. It's, it's really bad. And oh, I'm a terrible person. And of course, what that does is recenter their own interest. It recenters the, their uh, involvement with themselves, if you like, and recentering re of whiteness as opposed to attending to the actual message those four-year-olds are giving them about what happens in our education system and our society that makes four-year-olds understand the world through that, through that lens. What is it? Then you get anger. So you get some are shocked, some are silent, and some are very angry. And I have to be honest and say it is mostly the white men who get very angry at this point in, in, in my work with, them, with student teachers anyway. And their anger is, they say, no, no, I'm, I'm angry because uh, the methods of this research aren't fair. You know, how do I know which schools they've done this in? You know, they ask lots of questions about the research, which are valid questions, but mean they don't have to listen to the messages that the four-year-olds or the messages that we need to talk about. And more importantly, they, they call their anger, it's, they, they say their anger is not due to being defensive. No, 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 it's nothing to do with them or their positionality, but it's a moral indignation of a falsehood represented as reality. And it's my fault for doing that. Um, and therefore any claims about racism that we might want to interrogate from resulting from these four-year-olds are invalid because the research is invalid. And therefore there's no need for them to, to focus on complicity or anything like that. And again, in both cases, the status quo is maintained. So that's one of the ways in which their re emotional reaction to one of the videos um, that I show them works. Um, and what I have to do is help them have a more nuanced reflection of their emotional reactions. I have, I have to help them get over the navel gazing. And one of the ways I attend to their anger is to preempt their anger. And that makes them even more angry, but actually it works. Uh -huh. So I say, you know, you, you might feel resistant to the message of these four-year-olds. And I want you to think about why you feel that resistance. So I put the onus on them thinking about, oh my goodness, why do I feel so angry? And then we look at um, one of the other videos we look at is the original Eye of the Storm with Jane Elliott. Um, and for example, we look at racism um, as a relational practice, which is something you can see very clearly in this video. Um, and it, 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 it's comfortable for the students to an extent because it's a historical piece and it's in another country. But it does show how powerful the teacher's discourse can be. Um, anyway, more importantly, though, is the next video, which I think I'm going to be able to play a little piece of. I'll, I'll play it at the end of talking here. But this is the very last time Jane Elliott did her um, Eye of the Storm experiment outside of, her, outside of the classroom. And this was in London in 2009 and people were asked to join an experimental um, setup and they came along to this warehouse on the banks of the Thames in London and um, I play almost a whole video or mu much of it, a good 20-30 minutes and the students by that point in our work together have to identify examples of colour blindness, the, the things I was talking about before and it's very powerful because at that point it becomes, oh dear, this is fairly relevant, uh, re recent, it's in England, I have to attend to this. This is something that might teach me something about myself. Um, and yeah, it works pretty well to help them overcome all those emotional aspects. 
that were once attended to themselves or to me and suddenly they become angry about education and the education system. But I want to, before I play a little bit clip of that video, I want to make it clear that um, the student teachers, I don't just do all of this challenging and exposing and then say, right, off you go out into the world. Um, you know, they, I help them think about ways that they can use their knowledge. In other words, I give them responsibility to act. And, and, you know, here are some of the ways that I do that. I ask them to unlearn the practice of whiteness, to disown the practice or unlearn it, and not to be unwittingly reinforce whiteness and, and, and racism. And, um, you know, maybe this quote by Hughes in Gillies or Gillies is really, you know, an important one. Um, they say that um, when you learn to recognize the, the funky smell of racism, it will make life as usual a little different. And that's certainly what my students tell me they have experienced. Um, do you want me to play a tiny bit of that video, Peter? Yeah, I think that would be useful. That's if it works. Yeah. Okay, so wait a minute, I've got to share screen again. I'm going to go to here. Can you see it? Yeah, I want to come up now. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to play a very short section, and this is part of the what the student teachers witness. Against it, and you'll end up criminalised, outcast, and removed from the situation. Well, Marvin, what you said, I agree with, but it's not colour. You could be a skinhead and not want to pick your kid up in school. No, you no, can, no, you no, can no, be a skinhead. The, the skinhead can let his hair grow. With, I'm, I'm talking wholly and exclusively based on the colour of my skin. Nothing else. Just, just to qualify the thing about the school, part of the reason I don't go to, school, to the school is because, I mean, I'm mixed race, so I'm only half caste. My daughter is a, has got a white mother, which means she's even lighter than me. Therefore, I believe that most, if not all, of the people at that school think she's white. If I turn up, yeah, then the children will see a different... And treat her differently. And, and, and again, it's, 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 it's not necessarily because these kids are, are ignorant. It's because these kids live in an environment that's wholly of white people. I chose to play the game. That's right. That's it. We have to play the game. Yeah. There is this game we have to play to get by. We play the game as well. My ex-husband, for example, is in the sporting environment. He's taking on top quality customers, the RAF, people like that. But he conforms. He has to wear a business suit. He has to wear a tie. He has to speak beautifully. He has his short back and side hair cut. He looks immaculately groomed. He's actually a rugby player from way back. He's happy wearing sloppy old jumpers. Is he, he used to have his hair longer. Is he white? We have to conform as well. Is he white? That's not so, I'm to, you're talking about conforming. I'm he would conform I'm, I'm to pick up my I'm daughter talking. from her school. He would not turn up looking like a scruff bag with long hair, bad clothes, bad breath, unwashed, bad shoes. No, no, no. It's exactly the same. You're talking about your school environment with your daughter. It's my school environment. Would, we all agree that it's not the same. It's not the same. It's not the same. Not the same. Not the same. Sorry. Yes, yes. Maybe yes. We'll, yes. Let's, let's, let's agree. Let's, 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 let's agree to disagree. But there was the assumption that racism is only particular for people who are black. And I don't actually agree with that. I think there's racism for white people just as much. I've been in a situation many times where I've had remarks made about my person, the fact that I'm white, that I'm blonde, that I'm getting old or whatever. I'm sorry, I can't listen to any more of that. Yeah, my goodness. I mean, the fact that she's revealed as a school teacher and then later in the video, mm. she says, I must admit, I've got a bunch of half casts in my class. This is the, the term mm. she uses. And one of them fell over in the playground. And I must admit, where she cut her skin, I was shocked to see pink underneath. I mean, by then, the student teachers were just so angry. And actually, the undergraduates that I work with are so angry. And they begin to see how whiteness operates in our society. And then we begin to uncover, well, what does that mean for education? Mm. So I guess 
one of the things, the important thing is how to deal with the emotionality of whiteness, how to fracture mm. that emotionality. Mm. And it's interesting because I watched that video a couple of weeks ago and Did it, you? Yeah, and earlier on in that there's like some people walk out, like they almost can't stomach the whole exercise at all and like there's two or three people that left. Yeah, at the beginning, yes. Yeah, they were kind of like, they kind of fell out with Jane Elliott and like walked out, so um, but I was, I'm still stunned by that school teacher. I mean, mm -hmm. and she works in a, a multicultural school as well. A primary school teacher, yeah. 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 Um, so that well, brings it really close to home that, that and I, I've yeah. written about this in terms of documentaries and how useful documentaries are as opposed to um, um, you know, literature or, or fictional accounts, mm. which are also very useful. But I find that student teachers, you know, they, they, it's a really interesting exercise to analyze fictional accounts mm. or authors, but it doesn't then bring it close to home. It doesn't make them address their own positionalities or their own complicity silences mm. within systems. And it doesn't provide them with mechanisms to um, change to act. Mm. Yeah, so bringing it closer to them makes means it's, they're more likely to actually want to change something rather than it just being distant and remote from them. Yeah. 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 I even had one student once who was working in a school, um, actually not far from where I'm sitting now, uh, in an area where the BAMP and EDL were on the rise and a lot of the parents were a member of the English Defence League. And um, she was very brave, and she did, she did a version of brown eyes, blue eyes in that classroom. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, and um, and I understand you've got some um, like videos and things that, that your students have done that you you might be able to share if they give you permission. Yes. Yeah, so the the student teachers as part of the undergraduate social justice and education module that I teach. Mm -hmm. Some of the student, all of them have. All of the students have to produce a video and some of those videos are about anti-racism and you know they as i said before they i learned so much from the students they are unbelievably good and um i think it would be really useful to share those as you know for, for all of us to learn from the students voices as well yeah you know that, that sounds great so we can share them with this and the other the other resources so, so you've been teaching about this, but you've also been writing about this for some time. Is there, yeah. is there like one piece that you've written that you think really brings all this stuff together? That you, you know, if you were to, if people were to say, "Oh, Heather, I want to read your work," is there one piece that you've written that, that we, we should read? Is there one piece, or is it more? Is it not like that? Well, I can't really choose one piece, and I'm always more interested in what I'm writing at the moment. And um, so I'll tell you a tiny bit about that. I'm I'm doing a critical discourse studies approach to analysing the race disparity audit, which is remarkable for its absences. Very few times is racism itself actually mentioned, and also um, the agentive voice is almost entirely missing in this um, in the whole of the race disparity order and all of the paraphernalia that come around it comes around it so I'm, I'm actually analyzing that at the moment and I really want to get that out there because I think it's an important piece but um any of the pieces that I've written on sort of using documentary viewing um I've also written a piece on um on fundamental British values which is called um um Britishness as ra racist nativism which is another uh, concept within uh, critical race theory. Right, that's great. So they, I assume they're all on your your webpage and your publications if, if people yeah. are interested. Um, yeah. And I suppose just one final thing that um, I'm conscious some people might say, um, like some people might object to the fact that we are two white people having a conversation about anti-racism. Like what, how would you respond to that? Yeah, and I think that's a really valid question to be fair. Um, but I hope in what I've present, you know, what, what I've talked about today, it's clear that it cannot be the sole responsibility of black people or people from BAME, <clears throat> BAME communities who experience racism. It shouldn't be their responsibility to teach us all about racism and to overcome racism. So racism affects all of every member of society. Um, it's one of the oppressions that we have to overcome and therefore everybody should be responsible for anti-racism, including, of course, white people. But 
it doesn't really end there because I think it is, it is, I have to acknowledge that as a white teacher educator teaching students, student cohorts that are predominantly white student teachers about whiteness mm -hmm. <laughs> takes up academic space um, especially when I write about it, it takes up academic space. It it, it almost acts in a in a in a, a, a very annoying way to recenter whiteness, to recenter the white voice. So I am very very conscious of that, and um, you know this is a quandary that that we live with. But I mean it's an absolute minor quandary compared to the larger subject of racism in our society. Yeah. Yeah, so um, Heather, I just want to really thank you for taking the time um, to speak to us today and share your um, vast experience of research and teaching around anti-racism, your 16 years of experience um, and um, you know, what looks to me like very inspirational and very carefully thought through forms of uh, pedagogy with your students. Um, and as I said at the start of the video, Heather and I are um, working together um, on, on this um, and our plan is to share uh, other videos from other members of staff um, and uh, students at the university to share their work and the resources and really um, to develop a broader conversation about anti-racism um, and we hope that you will follow up on some of the ideas that, um, that Heather's discussed today, perhaps look at some of Heather's work, look at our student, the work that our students have done um, so we can really take these ideas forward. Uh, so thank you very much for listening. And thank you for asking me. No problem, great.